Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. Well, after a couple of vlogs to keep things going and discuss current events, it's time to get back to work. Also, I'm caught up on school, which helps me get back to work, and, well, I'm due for a Nintendo Power Review. So, time to get back to Chrono Gaming with Power, with issue number three of Nintendo Fun Club News. This issue is somewhat groundbreaking by including, for the first time, cover art. In this case, this issue, we have art for The Legend of Zelda, which I will not be reviewing at this time because I reviewed it last time, though I will be revisiting it later. Similarly, this issue also has a cover and interior art that is in color, as opposed to the sort of monochrome art that we had in earlier issues. Moving inside, we have an ad from Taito for several of their games. That's right, we have ads in the Nintendo Fun Club news for particularly for titles from third-party publishers. Now, this is a short-term thing, as once the Fun Club news becomes Nintendo Power, the ads generally go away. Though, kind of to be fair, the overt ads like this one would be replaced with more subtle ads in terms of the feature articles, which would cover both third-party games as well as Nintendo's own titles. The mag magazine also now has enough content in it to, well, merit a table of contents, which is kind of impressive, considering the last couple issues were six pages at most. Getting to the actual content, we have our feature article on Metroid. In addition to describing the game, we also get hype for the game's password feature. I don't know, I wouldn't call having to use passwords instead of being able to save your game a feature. The article is also notable by including screenshots for the first time. Now, this is rather minimal in comparison to the full-on screenshot maps that Nintendo Power would be famous for, but still, it's a leg up over the last two issues. Metroid itself is a rare case of a game that is partially responsible for lending its name to an entire genre or subgenre of games. Most games that this has happened to tend to only do it in the short term. For example, no one calls first-person shooters Doom clones anymore. At least no one who hasn't been living under a rock for the past, oh, 20 years. To my knowledge, the only other games that have done this, aside from Metroid, have been Doom, Cl have been Wizardry clones for the first person dungeon crawler, and Rogue for basically perfecting the randomly generated dungeon crawler, or roguelike. For Metroid, there's the Metroidvania game, the generally non-linear action platformer, which encourages players to explore the world and which opens up new areas of the world through the use of power-up weapons and items that are found throughout it. The other half of this genre or subgenre, Castlevania, really wouldn't make its contribution until Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which is much later on, though it kind of start making steps in that direction with Castlevania 2 and 3, which I will get to in due time. Metroid itself is a major part of what I'd call the Nintendo canon which we talked about previously with Mario and Legend of Zelda. And it's there for a good reason. The game controls very well, with an ability to shoot in multiple directions, and a level of exploration that was fairly new for platform games. The Legend of Zelda would have a similar focus on information, or had a similar focus, but it didn't add the platforming elements, and those wouldn't really come up until Zelda 2, which again, is something coming later. And while this game has its faults, such as the inability to save your game, and no option to view a game app, those limitations feel like problems of the hardware, in terms of not wanting to include the battery backup to save money on the game and to make it less expensive, and for the map feature, well, I mean, the NES only has really four buttons, not including the D-pad, so I want to cut them some slack there. Next up is Kid Icarus. While Kid Icarus is a cult classic first-party Nintendo game, I wouldn't consider it as major a title as, say, well, Metroid or Legend of Zelda. The game is a fairly basic platformer, with some upgrade options related to collecting hearts from enemies and turning them into shopkeepers as currency to get upgrades. However, 
the game, because it has a very vertical style to it, is not very backtrack friendly. In fact, it actually ends up making the platforming a little more difficult. Normally with Mario Brothers and stuff, while you can't backtrack and you're locked in once you advance further, it's not a situation where if you miss a relatively minor jump, like going onto a pipe or that sort of thing, you're generally okay. It's not going to be a certain death situation. However, with Kid Icarus, because it's vertical and because you can't backtrack, if you miss a jump or run into problems, you're done. Also, you only have one life in this game, and while there are power-up items that can give you extra lives, that can refill your health if you are run, run out, it's still a little less forgiving than other platformers. It's very, it's very harsh as far as these Nintendo first-party titles go, particularly, again, compared to Super Mario Bros. or Metroid. While I see its appeal... Now that I've finally gotten around to playing this game after hearing about it for so many years, I'm just not a fan of this game. If you like it, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with you, and I don't hold it against you. It's just not my thing. Now, before we get to our other two feature games from this issue, we do have our Pro's Corner column in here, where we get a bunch of tips for Legend of Zelda and Metroid. Most of these are general, basic pieces of advice in terms of um, getting particular items first and that sort of thing. But... We do get one particularly useful one for Legend of Zelda, which basically allows you to save your game from wherever you are by pressing up and start on the second controller. There's also an assortment of continue codes for various games. In particular, Gradius has a continue code which looks kind of like the Konami code but with a twist, and it looks kind of hard to pull off with all the button presses at one time. Uh, I mean... To be fair, it's Gradius, it's a shooter, it's kind of supposed to be hard, but still, that's a bit excessive. The next two games we get a look at are Mike Tyson's Punch-Out! and Rad Racer. Both get screenshots, though Rad Racers aren't until later in the issue. They kind of shuffle those back for to page 80 or so for space constraints or some stuff like that. Punch-Out! is a port of a Nintendo arcade game, but a fun port of an arcade game. Most arcade ports for home consoles run into the problem of when they're brought over, they're basically kind of brought over with that same sense of evil that arcade ports are, arcade games are made with, where they want to eat your quarters, they want to take your money, and they're designed with a sense of difficulty to make you keep feeding those quarters in. But the difference being that whoever designed the port forgot to realize that the Nintendo doesn't have a quarter slot on there, and so instead they still stick limited continues and other stuff on there just to kind of make it harder and more difficult and, well, more evil than it would if you were just playing, say, 1942 or Akari Warriors on an arcade cabinet with free play turned on. Now, this game is fun, it's enjoyable, and it controls incredibly well. The movements of the characters, of your character as little Mac, basically feels like it is intuitive and makes perfect sense. My only problems I have with this are basically that the characters are kind of racist car caricatures. Other than that, I mean, everything's intuitive. When I get beat, I feel like I got beat justifiably because I wasn't controlling the character correctly. I didn't do things the right way. I made an error. I made an error, and I wasn't fighting the system. It wasn't because the controls weren't responsive enough. It wasn't because the game was acting more quickly than I could reasonably respond. I messed up. It's my fault. I'm not mad at the game. It's justifiable that things happened this way. And that's what makes a truly good hard game. It makes you feel your error is due to your skill and that you need to improve as a player in order to proceed as opposed to cheating and stacking the deck against you to make you frustrated and upset. Good difficulty is enemies that have a pattern that's difficult to work out and you have to adjust to. Bad difficulty is bad camera angles, sluggish controls, and getting shot by enemies from off screen who you couldn't anticipate um, coming. This is an excellent, excellent game. Brad Racer 
frankly, is a game that is a real grind. The game is an outrun style racer, and this is a type of game that has always felt cheap to me due to the fact that these games get their difficulty in by setting faster and faster and shorter and shorter checkpoint times, or by putting random and unavoidable obstacles in the road, or mostly unavoidable. And this game, while it doesn't have insurmountable checkpoint times, it does have the bad habit of putting obstacles in the road which just block your progress entirely. A good example is occasionally the game will put three cars abreast in the road, which means that you cannot avoid them. You cannot maneuver around them, you will crash, and you will lose time. You may still reach the next checkpoint, depending on your performance thus far, but you hit those cars, you are in a world of hurt for a game like this. Now, while Rad Racer is Square's first outing in this magazine and with these reviews, it's definitely the weakest title that is covered in this issue. Tying into the cover, we now get what is essentially a complete overworld map for The Legend of Zelda's first quest, which is why I'm holding off on revisiting for a moment, because we do get coverage and stuff for the second quest later, and I want to save discussion of the second quest for then. We also get a description of Zelda II, The Adventures of Link, and a discussion of RC Pro-Am, which is, at this point, only known as Pro-Am Racing. Presumably, they changed it to remote-controlled cars because they realized, oh, hey, you're blowing cars up in the middle of this race. Maybe we should change the remote controls or something to avoid annoying people. Yeah, I mean, this issue was during that era where they were thinking about censoring Tom and Jerry and Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner, because they thought people would act, kids would actually drop anvils on people's heads. <sighs> anyway, we get our high score rankings next, and with one, and we have one entrant on the list who's from Oregon. Woot! Oregon represent! Letters column has a lot of requests for tips, which will probably lead into the counselor's corner column once Nintendo Power itself starts. We also have some teasing in this issue of the concept of multiple minus worlds in the original Super Mario Brothers, which is a bit mean because there's really only one Minus World, and I'd assume that Nintendo knew that. I understand wanting people to explore the game and that sort of thing, but there, there's, you know, promoting exploration by, say, not saying where all the warp zones are, and encouraging people to go looking for warp zones, and then they're just going, oh, hey, there's this glitch. There's probably a whole bunch of other glitch Minus Worlds in the game, too, or something like that. I don't know. We also get some profiles of several of the Nintendo game counselors, something that would also come up again later when we get the counselor's corner columns. And there's also a picture of Howard Phillips playing the drums from a Nintendo promotional event. So I guess in addition to being a bow-tied Ric Flair, he's a bow-tied, nicer Buddy Rich, which I guess would also make him a bow-tied Neil Pert. Anyway, we get more pictures of Nintendo merch, primarily T-shirts, as well as some more information about the NES Advantage controller. And we wrap up with a word search and a solicitation for reviews, something which I doubt a house organ magazine would do in these days, particularly in the age of the angry video game nerd. So for my pick of the week, or pick of the issue, well, this was a tough one. We had a lot of really highly regarded titles here. Well, a couple highly regarded titles here, and one cult classic, or one that's considered a cult classic. I'm going to go with Metroid for my main pick here, with Punch-Out being a close second. Um, honestly, as far as Punch-Out goes, I would say in terms of whether you're getting Mike Tyson's Punch-Out or just regular Punch-Out, it really depends on your preference. I mean, the original, you get to fight Iron Mike, and by all accounts, he is a tougher opponent than Mr. Dream in the re-release, but... You're not fight you're only fighting him once. Most of the time you're going up against Bald Bull, or you're going up against Piston Honda, or that sort of thing. And going up against them multiple times, and that's kind of where the fun comes in. So honestly, it, it's up to you as far as which one's available and what you can afford to pay. This is, of course, if you're not getting it for collection. If you're getting it to play for your own entertainment, if you're going for completionist collection then really my recommendation doesn't matter much because you're trying to grab everything anyway. But with that said, anyway, next week, I haven't done a book review in a while. And by all accounts, based on viewing information, 
you like my book reviews. Now, I've read some books in the intervening time, as those of you who follow me on Twitter or follow my account on Goodreads will know. So, let's do a book review. I'm going to take a look at something recent, relatively recent, with a book by John Scalzi. His, for lack of a better term, reboot of H. Beam Piper's Fuzzy series with Fuzzy Nation. Until then, I'll see you next time.